Welcome to episode 85 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for a long time now. And Mike also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode is part two, the final part of our series discussing whether David Perlmutter and Rick Johnson are right about fructose and uric acid and whether this means that we should be avoiding fructose. And as I mentioned in the last episode, this isn't personal toward either uh, David Perlmutter or Rick Johnson. We're just discussing uh, whether or not we agree in terms of their interpretation and view of fructose and uric acid. And with that in mind, throughout this series, we've been digging into the physiology and biochemistry surrounding this question and working to break it down into simpler terms so that it's easy to understand. And in today's episode in particular, we'll be focusing on whether we should be avoiding fructose-containing foods due to their potential to increase uric acid. We'll be discussing whether the fact that we lack the uricase gene means that we shouldn't be consuming fructose-containing foods. We'll be discussing the role of endotoxin and gut health in uric acid production and gout. We'll also be talking about which fructose sources are ideal for our metabolic health and how to adjust fructose intake if someone is dealing with insulin resistance non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or gout. This series has been inspired by a couple of listener questions. If you have any questions that you'd like us to answer on a future episode, feel free to send those in to j at jfeldmanwellness.com. That's j-a-y at j-a-y feldmanwellness.com. Or leave those in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. If you are new to the podcast, then after listening through today's episode, I'd highly recommend you go back and listen to episodes one through seven where we took some time to uh, build a foundation as far as the understanding of the bioenergetic view is concerned. To check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we reference throughout today's episode. And if you are dealing with any low energy symptoms or chronic health issues, whether those are related to fructose and uric acid, maybe you're concerned about insulin resistance or gout, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, or any other chronic health issue, maybe autoimmune conditions. Maybe that's low energy symptoms like chronic cravings and hunger, low energy or fatigue, joint pain or other forms of chronic pain, weight gain, digestive symptoms, brain fog, poor sleep or insomnia, or hormonal imbalances, or any other low energy symptoms or chronic health issues, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, let's get started. So let's talk about the whole uricase situation because that's kind of a separate but important piece here to their argument. So the their argument is essentially that as humans, we don't have this uh, enzyme uricase and they're, us and our closely related apes don't have uricase. And their argument is that the deletion of the uricase genes was something that allowed us to survive by increasing fat storage from fructose. And that, again, allowed us to survive in winters or in periods of famine. And because we have this uricase, we then can't handle a lot of fructose because it's just going to produce all this uric acid and we can't convert that uric acid out to other things. And that's a major problem. It's very harmful. So for that reason, we have to be very careful with our fructose intake. That's essentially the arguments that's being, that is being made. And there's a lot of problems with that argument. And I think some of the clearest ones, we'll go, go through a bunch of them, but some of the clearest ones do come when we look at those ape relatives of ours. And again, these these apes, you know, chimps and gorillas, and you know, we'll talk through some, some details here, they don't have uricase, but they all eat very large amounts of fruit. And the ones that, and we'll talk about this, but the ones that tend to be the most intelligent and most advanced eat the most fruit. 
Uh, we'll talk about some details there. And they thrive in this high, like on this high fruit diet, despite the fact that they don't have uricase and they live extremely long. But they're very obese, right? <laughs> and that's the last thing I was going to say is they're massively obese. As you know, <laughs> all wild apes are extremely obese. Exactly. <laughs> But as you're going to get going to get at in a second, Mike, I'll let you um, describe it. But but essentially, of course, we're not actually seeing obese apes naturally. They're very very lean. Um, the other piece here that I want to mention before we talk about some of the details there is this argument that maybe this helped us survive in the winter. You know, we needed to like uh, us apes needed to gain fat so we can make it through the winter. Well, no other apes other than humans live in climates with a real winter. Like they all live in tropical climates where you have the food that they really need all year round, which is fruit, there. And so they don't have real winters, at least the vast majority of them. Of course, there's some monkeys that do, but uh, some of the monkeys do have the uricase still. Um, but of course, these apes are living in basically year round summer and they're eating fruit year round and often as more than 50% of their diet, or at least in some of the most intelligent and longest lived ones. And yet, if as uh, Rick Johnson says, nature is trying to make us fat and there's an evolutionary mismatch that we just lack this uricase gene. And so, uh, you know, it just has to make us fat when we eat too much fructose. Why are these apes not obese? And Mike, I'll let you talk specifically about the bonobos and how not obese they are despite their very heavily, uh, very highly fructose containing diet. Yes. Yeah, so they have much more fructose than your average American who is um, what is it? The sixty percent of the U of the U.S. is overweight, uh, and then I think like thirty percent or something like that is obese. So, uh, let the first thing we'll clear up here is: are these are these animals obese or are they overweight? Um, so what? We, so basically, this table comes from this study here. Uh, body composition in pan paniscus compared with Homo sapiens has implications for changes during human evolution. Evolution. So pan paniscus is the bonobos. And what we're comparing here is their body fat percentage. So female bonobos have a body fat percentage of around 3.6%. Male bonobos have a body fat percentage of around 0.005%. So they're stage ready all year round. Um, and then uh, <laughs> male, female humans, based on this study, they had an average body fat percent of 36%. And then males were about 20%. Um, so these numbers, even for even for humans, maybe these are a little bit on the higher side, um, depending on the population you're looking at. But even so, I'd say these are probably close to I would say they're probably close to average, just considering some of the things that we talked about. But we have a, the overall the point being here is that the bonobos, which are the smartest and um, most frugivorous apes that that we know of, have very low body fat percentage, despite the fact that they lack uricase and despite the fact that they eat uh, so i have another graph up here and basically it, fluctuation and availability um so uh figure a is fluctuation and availability of flowers ripe fruit and young leaves and then b is variation in intake of flowers ripe fruit and young leaves and basically if you can see here let me see if i can if i can make this a little bit larger so essentially what you see here is um this top bar here is fruit, ripe fruit. So between 60 to 100% of the apes diet is fruit um, overall. So we're, we, <laughs> we basically have like pure frugivores um, pretty much. Yeah, year and, round. <laughs> this is, this year, is round. year round. Yes. Where's this, their winter? Aren't, aren't they packing on all the pounds for winter? Um, I don't know what apes you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> of great apes or bonobos you're talking about so essentially they have a 60 to 100 percent fruit diet um when we break this down a little bit they say in the study here essentially that um the average daily caloric intake of female chimpanzees estimated in this study was it was 2500 kilocalories uh, was slightly greater but comparable to estimates from previous study of uh kanyawara chimpanzees so Ch bonobos are essentially a class of chimpanzees and i couldn't find specific information that was directly about bonobos diet but it, so the next best thing was looking at chimps diet because i want to see the macro breakdown and basically kind of get an estimate of how much fructose that they were having so we have a 60 to 100 percent fruit diet in in the bonobos apes are pretty close to that 
Um, and essentially they have about 2,500 kilocalories per day. So what did you see here? And, and then of those kilocalories, so I have this table here. And essentially what you're seeing is that about 60%, it's about a 60% carbohydrate diet with 1,500 kilocalories of carbs from fruit-based sugars. So if you convert that into grams, you have about 375 grams of carbs with roughly half of that as fructose because the main fruits that they're eating are things like figs, um, which are like a one-to-one -one ratio of glucose to fructose. Um, and then there's some other fruits that they had some other fruits. I think they were like droop uh, of the droop family. Um, then after that, when you look at fat, you have about 30% fat diet. And then the 10%, uh, what was left was available protein was 317 cal kilocalories, came out to be about 10% of diet, which was about 80 grams of protein. So you're looking at, um, to, just to give an overall breakdown of the diet, but you're looking at about a, a mostly carbohydrate-based diet, 60% carbohydrate, and about 187 grams, probably a, maybe a little bit less of fructose. So even if we were, even if we were half as much, we're still twice as much fructose as the average as the average um, person in the United States, which we established the mean intake was 48 grams. So even if we have a margin of error of 50% based on my calculations, we're still at 90 something grams of, or was it 93.5 grams of fructose for the apes and the body fat percentage. Again, when we come down here for the average human male is 20%, females 30%. And then in the bonobos, it's 0.5% and 3.6%. And the bonobos actually have a higher intake of <laughs> of fruits than chimpanzees do. Um, so yeah, we're like the that whole idea that the lacking the lack of uricase and consumption of fructose allowed us to hold on extra fat isn't really holding water in the other species that have this situation. For example, the great apes, including bonobos and chimpanzees, which have a larger intake of fructose than your average United States. Uh, citizen and have significantly like multitude order less body fat overall and both groups lack the enzyme uricase and a couple other things is they are eating very dense fruit like figs which rick johnson actually mentioned in one of his interviews those being incredibly dense in fructose and sugar and as in something that we should avoid you know they're like candy and uh yet that's what they're thriving on and again, if you want to make the argument that there's an evolutionary mismatch and we were supposed to be eating this fruit that had very, very low sugar and we could barely ever find it, and that's what we had evolved for and that's what our genetic makeup is for, then how do you explain these bonobos now that are eating very dense, car like very dense sugar-based carbohydrate as the majority of their diet? And not only are they lean, but just for <laughs> like just to help conceptualize 0.005% body fat. So a lean male human who is maybe 10%, you got, you know, you can see at least the four pack there, like there's abs showing, um, which you even at like 16% body fat, you'll normally, you know, still have like the top abs. But so 10% is like relatively lean. That is 2000 times fatter than an average bonobo. Ten, a, hu a male human with 10% body fat is 2000 times fatter than a male bonobo. And if you have 20% body fat, which still is not like, it's not obese, it's just a, a little overweight, that would be 4000 times. Uh, an average male bonobo. Yeah. The other thing to put in perspective here too, is that the, there were different types of fruits besides figs and they, they listed them as droops in here. And these fruits actually had a higher content of sugar than the figs. And I think that the, from what they discussed here, there's an increased feeding time for those fruits by the chimpanzees over the figs because they were had more sugars overall. So there's like a preference for <laughs> energy dense fruits. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's it. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There's, a, there's more, but there's more. So, but that, that's super important. We, we talked about this, um, the situation of intelligence a good handful of times we've talked about in the past, but just to mention it a little bit, like still very briefly, but just to mention it is that you do see in these apes that the ones that eat more fruit and have the digestive sy systems that are designed to eat more fruit with smaller, large intestines, so they're relying less on the fermentation of, of fibers to produce short-chain fatty acids. The, the ones that are not like that, that have the larger, small intestines, smaller, large intestines, and have more fruit, have larger brains. And it's been shown in the research that the diet is what is allowing for the larger brain as opposed to some other factor, like a lot of times social uh sociality will be something that's that's pointed to but 
Uh, there's good evidence that is actually the diet that is allowing for that. Of course, because, and this is something we didn't talk about before, but because energy, which fructose and sugar and carbohydrates and fruit are an amazing source for, uh, is what allows for greater intelligence and greater capacity and greater function. It's something we talk about all the time. That's why we focus from this view on, you know, on, that's why we're, we focus on the bioenergetic view of health. And we've talked about very support for this, right? And in, in showing things like this, that it allows for greater brain size. Uh, but also there's the expensive tissue hypothesis showing that less energy being used toward digestion allows for greater brain size as well. Both of those things kind of happening in parallel. We've also, we've also talked about like the constrained model of energy expenditure. Uh, we've also talked again about how energy is not the same as fat gain. So again, when you're converting fructose and glucose and, and any other substrate down to ATP, then that is not becoming fat. It's not, excess energy is not the same as fat gain. And so again, I'll, I'm just going to cite or um, reference earlier uh, podcast episodes of ours discussing that in more detail because it would take us a little bit too far, uh, similar to some of our tangents have already. But uh, yeah, just some things that I think are at least worth mentioning. Uh, but as far as things I want to dig at least a little bit more into detail on, uh, really the last point here in terms of the UK situation is how we as humans cope with higher levels of uric acid and whether it's really coping or it's actually a benefit and whether there's actually a reason for that that is not just genetic mismatch uh, where it was just a way for us to get fat and now we don't need to get fat so there's no use for it (laughs) Uh, and yeah so we have and so the study i i uh, cited earlier showing the benefits of of uric acid in terms of its antioxidant effects and that allowing for uh, the re- like extensions extensions in lifespan and reductions in cancer is an important piece here. I'm going to point to some other studies here as well. Uh, one thing I want to mention before we dig into these studies is just for reference, as humans, since we don't have uricase, we do have higher serum levels of uric acid as normal, healthy humans. It's still about five to twenty times higher than serum uric acid in most other mammals. So, and we'll get to this in a in a minute. I'll have an example where. You have moderately elevated, like what would be moderately elevated for us, levels of uric acid, which doesn't cause any immediate harm, you know, long term can be an issue. Uh, But you create those same levels in rodents and it will kill them. Like more than half of them will die and they'll have all sorts of uh, kidney issues. And so, again, kind of points to the fact that we're able to handle large amounts of uric acid. We have certain adaptations to that. And the uric acid itself is providing a benefit, it's providing a, a purpose beyond just making us fat and instead of just making us fat of course that's I'm saying that facetiously an important extension of this too is that when you're looking in rodent models at the effects of uric acid for metabolic syndrome and, and different things like that it's really mm-hmm. important to take into consideration that humans have evolved to tolerate and have larger amounts of uric acid in their serum and if you're trying to put it in some legitimate evolutionary context that <laughs> make sense of like uh, with an underlying perspective that there's purpose to things then you would then perhaps you understand that there may be a, a benefit to having those higher level levels of serum uric acid so again this is like this is the same thing going back to when we were discussing processing of fructose in human livers versus processing of fructose and refined carbohydrates in rat livers where mm-hmm. the, the studies are showing oh if you have you know x number of grams in in rats, you have all this de novo lipogenesis. But then when you convert that into humans, which technically evolved along a lineage of high fruit eating, which was what we see with the other great, or what we see with great apes, what you wind up seeing is that, oh, de novo lipogenesis from sugars is actually quite low in our species. So it's very important to understand that context, um, especially when you're trying to make justifications around like having zero <laughs> fructose diets because of DNL or or uric acid or whatever the deal is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So to dig into a couple of these studies, first one is titled hyperuricemia and urate nephropathy in urate oxidase deficient mice. So they state to create a mouse model for hyperuricemia and gout and to address the question of whether urate oxidase is essential in lower mammalian species, we've disrupted the urate oxidase gene in the mouse by homologous recombination in embryonic stem cells. Unlike the human situation, urate oxidase, urate oxidase deficiency in mice causes pronounced hyperuricemia and urate nephropathy, 
More than half of the mutant mice died before four weeks of age, indicating that urate oxidase is essential in mice. And the we'll get to the numbers here in a second, which are also demonstrative of, of the situation. But the other thing that they're kind of pointing out here is that we are fine. Like we maintain our uric acid levels and everything without urate oxidase. And these other animals have to rely on urate oxidase. So we must have some pretty good mechanisms for, for handling urate, uric acid without urate oxidase. Uh, because all you have to do is remove that in other animals and other mammals and their uric acid levels will shoot up. So this next uh, part of the uh, quote or next quote, which is later on in the study, they state that the serum uric acid of the homozygous mutants reached 11.0 plus or minus 1.7 milligrams per 100 milliliters, which is tenfold higher than that of wild type and heterozygous mice and about twice the value found in normal humans. And so this was the level that was causing more than half of the mice to die before four weeks of age due to uh, this nephropathy, this uh, damage and disease of the kidneys. And this was happening. So first off, they reduce, uh, you know, they take out urate oxidase and you have a tenfold higher increase in uric acid levels. Again, in humans without urate oxidase, we're stable. So we have good ways to handle uric acid. Again, just another reason why we shouldn't be so concerned about, I mean, every step of this process that we've discussed. Uh, but then they, they mentioned that this is a level that is just twofold the normal value in humans, but this is a level of 11 milligrams per deciliter. That is like you have, like people typically might have gout in that scenario, but they're walking around and they're fine. They're not dying. <laughs> you know, like these mice are dying before four weeks of age. I think they said, uh, in the study it was 65% of them did. And then of course the other ones are not just healthy and normal. And so while it's not ideal for us to have those values, we're obviously able to handle considerably higher values of serum uric acid compared to animals that do not have or that do have uh, urate oxidase yep. or uricase. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have much to add there. I did, it, my preface already is you know we're, we're looking at organisms that have humans specifically that have the ability to tolerate higher amounts of uric acid. There's an un, undisclosed reason so far with numerous theories about it and then trying to make adjust make assessments from animals that require uh uric uh, uric acid oxidase or your uric, uricase to function appropriately and then like make extensions to humans is quite i think a risky or questionable um proposition without taking into consideration those pretty drastic physiologic differences yeah 100 percent. yeah it's because of these huge confounding factors, as you're saying, it's it's really questionable whether we can just translate the research between the two. And when we look at the research in humans, as we've gone through quite a bit of it today, uh, it's it doesn't point in favor of this argument in terms of fructose and uric acid. Yeah. So this next study is talking a little bit more about the context, the evolutionary history, and some potential reasoning uh, for elevated levels of uric acid. Uh, and then also comparing it with uh, mice as well. So the study is titled Diabetes Insipidus in Uricase Deficient Mice, a Model for Evaluating Therapy with Polyethylene Glycol Modified Uricase. So they state that the uric acid creatinine ratio in the urine of uricase deficient mice ranges from 10 to over 30. On a weight basis, these mice excrete 20 to 40 fold more urate than do human subjects. So this is uh, mice without uricase and they're having these massive uh, loads of uric acid that they have to get rid of 20 to 40 fold as much. And then just it says after that the mice in the situation develop severe defects in renal concentrating ability, resulting in an approximately six-fold greater urine, urine volume and a five-fold greater fluid requirement compared with nor normal mice. They then go on to state that this nephrogenic diabetes insipidus leads to dehydration and death of nursing mice, but with adequate water replacement, high urine flow protects the adults from progressive renal damage. So they're able to to get along, you know, for a little while without major uh, kidney damage. If they piss it all out in extremely large volumes. Exactly. And that's and that becomes really relevant because when we look at our kidney function versus animals like uh, rodents, that's kind of our norm. And they, they talk about that as a way that we deal with higher levels of uric acid without any issue. So they then state that discussions, or later on, they state that discussions of uricase evolution have often speculated on advantages derived from the loss of the enzyme. So this is in, in us, you know, and in primates, they're saying that we must have benefited from losing it and they say such as increased longevity resulting from radical scavenging ability of urate a less anthropocentric anthropocentric view might consider the benefit of uricase to other species 
for which renal water conservation has been an essential adaptation to seasonal drought or arid climates. The avoidance of uric acid precipitation and maximally concentrated urine would strongly favor the retention of uricase. Its loss might lead to lethal nephropathy, as in uricase knockout mice. So what they're saying here is that in other, like the vast majority of other species, uh, water is a like a lack of water is a more relevant concern, and so they don't their urine is less is more concentrated typically. They aren't uh, urinating as much water. And so because of this, it actually benefits them to have the uricase to already get rid of the uric acid because they can't do it through their kidneys effect- effectively because it would cause this kidney damage. But they then describe why apes and humans might not have that same issue, which allowed us to then cope with higher levels that have other benefits. So they state that in contrast, ancestors of New World monkeys, hominoid apes, and humans in which the urate oxidase gene mutations became fixed may have lived in rainforests. With abundant water, maintenance of relatively dilute urine may have been better tolerated and favored as an adaptation to environmental toxins, as well as to the loss of uricase. Other protective mechanisms might have been in place or selected subsequently, uh, such as efficient proximal tubular reabsorption to limit the uh, access of uric acid to collecting ducts where maximal concentration and acidification occur, or shorter renal papillae uh, to limit distal water reabsorption. I'll finish this quote in a second and then decipher. The reduced ability of the neotenal kidney. Oh, this is an important part. So they then state that the reduced ability of the neonatal or neotenal uh, kidney to concentrate and acidify urine may protect human inf- uh, infants from uric acid nephropathy at a time when urate clearance is considerably higher than that in adults. So what they're pointing at here is that we can handle higher levels of uric acid in the serum and get rid of it effectively as long as there's enough water coming in. And if instead of this being the product of a situation where we were in famine and uh, winter and and drought and whatever else that we remove, like that we lost our uh, uricase uh, capacity, instead maybe it was a situation where we had adequate water, so we could actually handle elevated levels of uric acid without it being an issue due to uh, a concentration issue leading to precipitation, which is what leads to the like uric acid crystals and gout. And so they're saying that this could have been why we are able to have much higher levels of uric acid. And so again, I, there, we, we've kind of talked about a few different angles here, but they definitely don't land on the situation where uric acid is there, or yeah, uric acid is there in higher amounts in order to increase uh, fat gain. You know, we have discussions of increased antioxidant capacity of, of other benefits like uh, being able to excrete more toxins in the kidneys and other adaptations here, but none of this is suggesting that this is a bad thing, but rather actually a good thing. It's not an evolutionary mismatch, but rather we've developed this situation because it's something that supported us, increased our complex our complexity and our function, and therefore uh, continued on. Yeah, and the research basically says, yeah, I have a quote here um, from the study. It says, the majority of cases of elevated serum uric acid result from impaired renal excretion possibly because of inter-individual differences in function of the urate, urat transporter, urate transporter. So most issues of, and you can see, it, most of the issues around the uric acid situation isn't necessarily an uh, overproduction. So they talk about situations of overproduction. Um, and in those situations, it says production can be increased by several mechanisms, including rare enzymatic defects, states of high cell turnover, and alcohol ingestion, Partly because of purines contained in alcoholic drink, in, in alcoholic drinks. So, the the main areas that have been linked with the high with with causing or being the etiology behind the, the increased uric acid are states where you have a destruction of cells, right? You have a so perhaps like a cachexic state of cancer where you have this massive inf, uh, adjustment or massive cellular turnover, death and and growth, et cetera, et cetera causing phosphate depletion, increased serum phosphate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then also states of alcoholism, um, where you have increased production due to alcohol, and then also issues specifically with the kidney, where the kidney is causing um, uh, a lack of excretion. So, And it's that in most cases, it's la- it's an issue with the excretion, less so the production. So that's another thing to keep in mind, right? Because you have a situation, okay, so fruit, so even if fructose does increase your serum urate, if your kidney is able to excrete it, is it still a problem? Um, that's the other the other question to keep in mind. Uh, mm-hmm. And they talk about pathological states as well. And they talk about um, in state in 
in states that have uh, like uh, kidney issues or whatnot, or where there's a buildup of uric acid, there's actually an increased secretion of uh, uric acid in the urine. So the kidneys have a degree of flexibility with compensation. But interestingly, a large proportion of uric acid is actually reabsorbed in the kidney. So I think like something like 10 to 12% is what's excreted. So that's another interesting piece of the puzzle is it's, it's the, the body is maintaining uric acid at a certain level. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, just some interesting pieces to consider in the overall picture of elevated serum uric acid. And they even talk about one of the quotes that I pulled out from th- this study um, is that it is argued that elevated serum uric acid in those with cardiovascular disease may simply reflect the presence of other risk factors such as hypertension or diabetes, diuretic treatment, impaired renal function, atherosclerosis itself, or increased oxidative stress. And they also say, therefore, the association may simply reflect impaired renal function and the associative associ- uh, oxidative stress and cardiovascular risk. While most studies have adequately adjusted for renal impairment, it cannot be excluded that raised uric acid concentrations reflect or contribute to subclinical levels of renal impairment, which contribute to the association in as yet undefined ways. So the the the, the problem with the the epidemiologic evidence and the evidence for the increased raised serum uric acid levels in people with diabetes, heart disease, and et cetera, is that a lot in a lot of these states they may have some subclinical renal impairment because the you, the kidneys are the major excretors of uric acid. Um, and then in that situation, it's hard to say, is this person is this person having all these negative effects because the uric acid is actually negative or are they having, do they have this, again, this overlying pathology that's leading to this elevation in uric acid? And then is that if you're in like super physiologic concentrations of uric acid, does that then, we know that that then adds to the problem. But is, what is the initial cause? Is the initial cause mm-hmm. the state overall? And if so, then like would addressing the state lower the uric acid? And then what is causing that initial state overall? So those the, the question is always going to come back to that context. What is going on in the initial state? And I mean, that's what now I guess the the, the next argument here is like if you're going to like is fructose, which we kind of discussed already, is that causing the initial state? And it seems unlikely. I mean, unless you're going to start doing, you know, 219 grams per day um, on its own in an excess of the rest of your diet. Yes, in a, a caloric excess. Um, or would something like fructose from fruit be an actual causative or problematic con- component here? Because the, essentially where this comes in, in the bioenergetic perspective or the perspective that we, we come from fruit and fruit juice is seen as an important food source. So where does that, so where does this all fit in with that? And we're, I guess this, the last piece to kind of get together here is essentially that it seems to be like largely a non-issue with fruit. Um, especially considering all of these, the, the elements of the argument that we've built beforehand. Yeah. And juice and dried fruit, all of it, you know, concentrated. We'll, we'll, yeah. Let's get into it. So in that practical sense, and, and even just to give them their, like, so to describe their view that they describe on fruit, basically it's that and on fructose as a whole, which as you were kind of getting at, everything you were describing was so much more than fructose, so much greater context, so much more going on here that is not driven by fructose, so much dysfunction that's not driven by fructose. Yet their focus is on fructose and their view is that we need to avoid it. Uh, but they do say that it's okay to get it in moderate amounts in certain fruits, especially the ones that have particularly lower amounts of fructose. And they say, you know, it's okay to have a couple apples and some berries and, you know, banana and whatever. Like it's okay to have some fruit. And there's a few reasons why they say it's okay. One is because they do acknowledge that it's packaged with glucose, but also that it's packaged with fiber. And so there's going to be slower absorption. Uh, also that there's bioflavonoids and polyphenols in there uh, that can help to uh, inhibit xanthine yeah. oxidase. And then lastly, that there's vitamin C and that the vitamin C helps uh, to excrete uric acid at the kidney. Yeah. Those are the three main ones. Yeah. and so. That's their kind of general view. But otherwise, like outside of that context, fructose is the problem and is driving these states. And, you know, one of the, and we kind of pointed this out when it comes to uh, the situation with the bonobos, but it's interesting that they're saying that like fruit is okay, yet 
their whole argument for the idea of having your case is that it was supposed to allow for fat gain. But the only thing that would have been available during that time is not sodas and candy and whatever else they're saying is the problem, but the fruit that they're actually saying is okay. So they're saying there's this evolutionary mismatch that would have that you know back then we needed the fat gain, but now you won't get fat gain from fruit. The fruit's okay; it won't cause fat gain. But that's why we had your case uh, get removed in the first place was to allow for fat gain. And they kind of like they're kind of half they try to get around it by just saying that. It's, it wouldn't have been a lot of fat gain, right? They aren't. They wouldn't have been obese. They just would have gained a little bit of fat that would have allowed them to get through a famine. Which, I mean, I don't know. Like an extra pound of fat is not going to help you get that much more through a famine than anyone else. Um, but, but also the entire argument for people nowadays in terms of like dieting and weight gain is that it's a small amount of fat that's added on accumulatively, accumulatively over time. It's not. No one is saying that you're gaining. A pound a day like it's always been that small amounts of fat gain contribute to large amounts of fat gain contribute to obesity and so if they're saying like are, are they saying that eating fruit now is okay because it would only cause a little bit of fat gain like it would have back then yet it's okay to eat that year round and that's not going to make us fat like there's a there's there's some i don't know there's some pieces here that aren't lining up and um so that's one of them and um there, there's a, a another piece of evidence that I want to mention, but I don't know if there's anything you want to say first. No, I mean, I was just going to talk more about the specific fruit piece. I, I don't think the argue. I think the whole evolutionary context that has been tried to be created around fructose and then fat gain through uric acid. It's like de novo lipogenesis arguments failed. So, like, let's try with uric acid now. And I, mm-hmm. first of all, in real life, we don't we're not seeing this right. Like, we're not. I'm not seeing people get obese with fruit. I don't think you're seeing people get obese with fruit. I'm not getting obese with fruit um, or fruit juice or any of these things. Um, it, and if it, like, yeah, I mean, looking look at, at fruitarians, like yeah. if there's ever a group of people who is, who is like not dealing with fat gain, it's fruitarians. Yeah. Anyway, and continue. they have large amount. <laughs> well, and the other thing too, is you're like, you're looking at an obesity epidemic inside the United States and Western countries overall. And you're not seeing massive fructose intakes. Like if we're looking at a mean fructose intake of 48 grams per day, we're comparing that to other animals that lack uricase who are eating at with a 50% margin of error on calculations, twice that number of fructose, and they're a thousand times leaner, <laughs> more than a thousand times leaner. The average weight for men, I think, was 20%, a body fat percentage was 20%. Like that, the whole argument, this whole evolutionary context for it is just not lining up. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem to make much sense. And then then like to then you start looking at studies like, okay, well, fruit isn't causing gout and fruit's not causing metabolic syndrome. And it's actually there's a lot of uh there's a lot of intervention studies even in in rats and mice where like giving pineapple juice impairs or uh blocks the development of metabolic syndrome in the high fat, high fructose, whatever feeding studies that they're doing. So, so it's like you're, you're seeing these opposite situations with fruit, with fruit juice, and then you're trying to like create this evolutionary argument that we lost uricase to put on body fat through fructose, but the only access to fructose we would have had would have been fruit, but fruit has inverse associations with body fat gain, obesity, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. It's like, it, that doesn't make any sense. There's like the pieces, the ducks aren't in order there. Um, now... And then even in modern examples, you're seeing that the ducks aren't in order as far as like fructose or sugar intake being the nail in the coffin for metabolic diseases. That, that you're not, you don't even have correlation in epidemiologic data that is, that is like strongly creating, like creating these ridiculously startling um, uh, associations. And then even when you get into the associations, it's like, okay, now when we look at causal studies and we do overfeeding with sugars, fructose, et cetera, it's like, okay, de novo lipogenesis less than 1%. So it's like, where is this obesity epidemic coming from with metabolic syndrome from fructose? The, and then the other thing is even beyond that, if we're going to put this into like the, the populations of people that actually look at or listen to this information who, who, you know, care about their health in any capacities, you're not seeing a bunch of paleo people or carnivores or vegans or plant-based or any of these groups of people, regardless of their differences, going out and being like, yeah, I'm going to get me that 32 ounce Slurpee. So I can get all of my 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 massive fructose bolus and I'm going to drink it in five minutes. That's not what you're seeing. It's like the question is, oh, can I is it OK if I have, you know, three oranges 
or is it okay if I have like two two kiwis and a banana? Like, is that going to be too much fructose in one dose? And it's like we're not even seeing like if you look in fruit study, the studies with whole fruit and things like that, you're not even seeing increases in uh, risks of gout. And even in fruit juice, the, the in a study listed by um, one of the researchers who uh, one of the names on the study I think was uh, Dr. Richard Johnson, right? So he was. He was listed on the study. The, he wasn't the lead author, though. And they discussed that out of all the fruit juices, only orange juice had been associated with gout. And they did looked at apple. They looked at grape. They looked at... There's a couple... There's a series of juices there. And even then, when you look at the studies with orange juice and other areas, there's an inverse mm. associations with those things. So, like, the fruit... The, the evolutionary perspective of it is quite shaky. And then when you start to get to fruit, it, like, really just falls apart. And again, neither of us are sitting here and saying, you know what? go out and have that Slurpee 32 ounces each meal. But when we're talking about like moving, making decisions for your health, we're talking about, okay, having fruit as your carb source, having fruit juice as your carb source and having, having fructose through those things, not being a problem and actually being healthy, considering all the other, there are benefits to fructose as we discussed, as you discussed in the, the, uh, the hepatic cell studies. But then also when you look at blood sugar regulation and when you look at if you have a normal functioning metabolism and then even beyond the fructose component, if you're looking at the beneficial components of fruit, you're seeing a whole bunch of beneficial effects. Who's to say that taking in the fruit or taking in fruit juice and the compounds and components that are present in the fruit and fruit juice doesn't help to fix that block down the respiratory chain or down the metabolic chain that allows fructose to be oxidized fully through and avoid the depletion of ATP, of, of ATP and then subsequent production of uric acid through that pathway. So that's, there's so many questions there and there's, there's like clearly, I mean, it's not even questions, like there's clear answers there looking at this and saying like, look, this really isn't a non-issue overall. This isn't the smoking gun that we're looking for. But yeah, taking in large doses of granulated sugar or free, specific, more specifically having large doses of free fructose in rapid boluses probably isn't ideal from a health perspective, but everybody already knew that. Like this isn't new information. We didn't need a whole book on that. <laughs> yeah, don't inject fructose. <laughs> don't inject 20 <laughs> grams of fructose um, and think that it's going to be healthy. And yes, we're not like we've never been a, uh, suggesting that people go out and eat Slurpees, right? Or drink Slurpees is like a good thing. Yeah. But as you're saying also, like not to diminish the difference here like we're also not saying like yeah it's okay to eat an apple or two and like maybe a banana like we're talking about getting large amounts of carbohydrates from fruit large amounts of fructose oh you know well over 100 grams a day potentially uh again in the right context and that is very different from what they're saying they're not saying that that's okay like that i don't want to i don't want the default response to be like oh well they never said fruit was bad and (laughs) <laughs> that's not really the case. And we're also talking fruit juice and everything, not really not being bad, not being a driver of this decision, this situation. So yeah, I want to make sure that that's, yeah. that there's a, a clear no, distinction We're talking there. large amounts of fruit. We're talking large amounts of sugar intake from fruit on a regular basis. Like, I don't know, what do I personally do? Maybe like three or 400 grams of sugar a day. And I'm still waiting for the obesity to come. I'm still waiting. Now, N equals one doesn't mean anything. Um, You know, but we also have groups of populations, as you mentioned, for example, fruitarians who are eating ridiculous amounts of fruit and large amounts of sugar and having largely carbohydrate based diets based around fruit specifically, and them also not being obese or develop or putting on body fat and large amounts of body fat. You're actually seeing them having a hard time maintaining normal weights. So it's just. And for other reasons, but yeah. Yeah. Um, For other reasons as well, of course. And, and also, I mean, N equals one matters a lot, right? I mean, for each person listening, it is an N equals one. And that's what matters probably the most to them, or unless they're trying to help someone else, which maybe it's an N equals one for that other person. But yeah, I mean, what else is there, right? Like, and, and, and I know the point that you're getting at, but also when we include each other and the people we work with and, and all the other people who are using this approach, it's a much larger N sample size as well as, as you're that's saying, true. Criterions and whatnot. That's true. But even that beside the point. So there was one thing you touched on earlier, which was talking about the low amount of uh, de novo lipogenesis from fructose. I wanted to just mention one other detail there, which is that in fatty liver disease, that 60% of the fat in the fatty liver is coming from our own fat stores that are uh, you know, through lipolysis. So again, fructose is not the primary com- like contributor there either. And we talked through that extensively in uh, 
in that fatty liver series, but just again, some numbers that just very clearly highlight and kind of silence that that opposing concept that it is fructose. And in, in those studies, they've shown that only about 25% of the fat in fatty liver is coming from de novo lipogenesis. And again, that's in the context of dysfunction, which... Yeah. Well, you can't, you can't oxidize the substrate. So you have to, your the liver has to convert it into fat. And again, right. this is, uh, again, uh, as always, con- that context is so important. Like you're talking about a completely deranged metabolic situation versus somebody who doesn't have a metabolic situation. Like what, when you put different substrate in, you have, like if I, if you put, if your engine is broken and you put gasoline in it, it's still not going to run well. Like you still are going to have problems. Like mm-hmm. it, so the question is always what's going on with the engine, what's going on in the cell with the mitochondria, how is glycolysis, the, um, how is the electron transport chain working, et cetera. And the, the study that you posted directly talks about those specific things. Like it, so besides adding fructose or dihy- uh, uh, the uh, glyceraldehyde or dihydroxyacetone, et cetera, into the, into the medium, they also added in things like methylene blue. And create an electron acceptor, et cetera, and fix some of those problems. And then you saw a regeneration of ATP and a lack of reductive stress. So there's like, yeah, that was that was in the like hepatocyte injury study. It, yeah, exactly the hypoxia study. Yeah, yeah, that fructose rescued the ATP production and everything. Yeah. But so speaking of of that context, and again, kind of bringing it back to, is fructose the cause here and and all of that? There was one more study I wanted to mention. That was actually something that was brought up by Rick Johnson in an interview. Where he was, he mentioned that you can do a like from fecal microbial transplants, where you're uh, transplanting the microbiome from one person to another, and when they do this from a healthy person to someone with gout, it improves their symptoms. Like their symptoms get better and their serum uric acid goes down. And it's like, well, that's interesting because we didn't, you know, you didn't change any behavior there as far as changing their fructose intake. And so if you look at that study, it actually is pretty telling when we talk about you know that kind of larger context. I'm going to uh, pull up a quote right here. So the study is titled Effects of Washed Microbiota Transplantation on Serum, Uric Acid Levels, Symptoms, and Intestinal Barrier Function in Patients with Acute and Recurrent Gout, a pilot study. And so the quote here, they state that the levels of DAO, D-lactic acid, and endotoxin were higher in patients, uh, this is gout patients, than in healthy donors. After the washed microbiota transplantation treatment, the levels of DAO and endotoxin decreased. And they say that the washed microbiota transplantation is effective for reducing serum uric acid levels and improving gout symptoms in patients with gout and contributes to improve their impaired intestinal barrier function. So again, this is no change in fructose intake. All they're doing is improving the gut health side. And one of the things that they specifically mentioned is reducing endotoxin and it improves their, uh, their serum uric acid and improves their symptoms. And we talked a lot in that fatty liver series about how much of an impact endotoxin has in inhibiting uh, mitochondrial respiration, driving de novo lipogenesis, driving oxidative stress. And of course, in this, t- in this case, it would be one of those things that drives uric acid production. And so, again, talking about that larger context and having nothing to do with whether you're having too much fruit juice or not is something like endotoxin. And that's why we talk about those kinds of things all the time. And I'm sure you would see similar things if you're looking at PUFA intake and and all sorts of other factors that affect mitochondrial respiration. Well, and we, we've seen this with obesity. We saw this with yeah. alcoholic liver disease. Every time you lower endotoxin in these situations, or you change the microbiome to produce less endotoxin overall, you see a decrease in obesity, a decrease in metabolic syndrome. It's like, let's talk about a real smoking gun. It's endotoxin. <laughs> yeah. It's not uric acid. And the, the, again, the mechanism here is it's not necessarily direct. Right, it's your the endotoxin is impairing mitochondrial function at the liver, and then it's leading to an impair like in those situations with gout, and leading perhaps to an increased production of uric acid or an impaired ability to clear uric acid, perhaps at the kidney. There's multiple mechanisms that you can have going on there, as well as D-lactic acid being a metabolic problem as well. So mm-hmm. again, yeah, it's, it, the the gut situation is a huge one. Now, here's an interesting hypothesis: perhaps the refined food which makes up the 70 the other 70 percent of the refined sugar consumption in the united states is leading to intestinal dysbiosis and that intestinal dysbiosis with subsequent production of endotoxin is driving these metabolic states and it's not necessarily the refined sugars inherently in and of themselves but perhaps if you have a 
dysbiotic intestine and then you dump a bunch of refined sugars or free form fructose in there well now you have endotoxin production now you have more disruption of the intestinal barrier now your liver is taxed now you have hepatic um uh hepatic like hepatic insulin resistance now you have fatty liver from because of the endotoxin situation etc it's like maybe that's driving the situation and it's not just you know fructose like when you look in the in the germ-free mice studies with alcohol they don't develop cirrhosis when they're the germ-free mice exposed to alcohol aren't developing cirrhosis they're not developing the same level of body fatness and obesity and metabolic syndrome on germ-free mice why is that well endotoxin i think is a huge driver and we've seen that pretty consistently so there's like there's so many different angles to look at it besides just fructose, ATP depletion, um, xanthine oxidase, uric acid, and then uric acid is is just like this terrible compound. It's like no, and every step of that process, there's question there's a questionable um, context there that's being that's being described to create this picture. It's like okay, well, how how much fructose do we actually need? to drive ATP depletion? What state is required for lower doses or for the doses of fructose to, to drive that ATP depletion in the beginning? Is that How is the fructose being administered? Are you getting it in the vein? Are you getting it large boluses orally that aren't getting absorbed? Are, is it going to be after that? It's like um, how, much, how much ATP is actually depleted and how much uric acid is even being created and is that even a problem? And then you know, what, where's, where else you're getting your fructose from? Is it coming from fruit? Is it coming with all these other compounds? So it's like every step of that hypothesis has questionable con that has context that needs to be questioned. And when you start questioning that context overall, you start to break down the argument. And it's just like, this is, this is a, this is a non-issue, uh, particularly if we're like in the context. That, so let's put our context together in a context of a diet that has um, adequate amounts of fruit and fruit juice as your carbohydrates and you're eating adequate amounts of protein, you're covering your vitamins and minerals, it seems very unlikely that the fructose-driven uric acid pathway is going to be this problem. And especially other thing as well is if you're on like a eucaloric diet, you're not eating in like 35% excess of your calories, which may cause problems overall regardless, depending on, especially depending on the metabolic state that you're coming from. Are we talking about diabetics and obese people? Are we talking about normal people? Are we talking about athletes? Like this all changes the situation. Yeah, but I also, just to clarify, I don't want to make it sound like it's overeating that's the driver here either because the dysfunction, like the dysfunctional mitochondrial respiration, decreased ATP, drives extra hunger, leptin resistance, that whole pathway. Uh, so it's not just that eating excess of calories is the problem either. Well, 219 grams of fructose. <laughs> I'm not saying that that is ideal. I'm saying that in a real context, context where someone is not force fed an extra 215 grams of pure fructose, the overeating is not the problem. It's not the the driver here. Um, the you know fixing types of foods, all of that should help if somebody is quote overeating. But again, that's all relative. And if you're going based on whatever calorie calculator and all that, I mean, there's so many issues there. So, uh, but but anyway, to to wrap up here, I want to focus on the practical app application. Kind of this last part that we've been talking about, talking around, uh, give some pra practical suggestions and some thoughts on the specific types of foods, fruits, dry fruit juices table sugar, uh, high fructose corn syrup, same, things like that. So that people have some some takeaways here, maybe in contrast to the takeaways that are provided from the opposing view that we, we've been discussing uh, in terms of just avoid fructose except very moderate amounts in fruit. And so what I would say, of course, as we're getting at is fructose doesn't need to be avoided. And there are differences between fructose sources, right? So when we're getting the juice versus the whole fruit, we're missing out on the fiber. So it's going to be absorbed quicker. And that means you're going to get more fructose and glucose and sucrose all at once. It's still not the same as injecting it at all, but it's going to be faster than if you ate whole fruit. That's something to consider depending on the context. We'll discuss that. Um, dried fruit is the only thing that I, that's being removed there is the water. So again, it's going to digest quicker. You'll see bigger blood sugar spikes and things like that. Again, fine, depending on the context. But between those three and all of them, you have the, the polyphenols, you have the nutrients, and you have a good balance of glucose and fructose. When it comes to table sugar or high fructose corn syrup, of course, when you have table sugar alone, it doesn't have fiber, it doesn't have polyphenols, doesn't have vitamins and minerals. And so that can be an issue. Um, it also can be absorbed very quickly. But if you were to combine it with those other things, then it should be better. And depending on the context, you might be fine with having some amount of table sugar. Um, 
And again, we'll talk about those contexts in a second. And then when it comes to high fructose corn syrup, this is one that even though there's a similar ratio of fructose to glucose as table sugar, uh, there's still some issues with it when it comes to heavy metal toxicity, possibly some starchy components in there that aren't accounted for, um, maybe some digestive issues that might result there from like the syrup uh, part of the corn syrup. Like I don't know if anybody's ever had like tapioca syrup or other syrups that they use to sweeten things. Sometimes those can cause some digestive issues because there's non-sugar carbohydrates that might be raw or not well cooked, not well digested. And so that can sometimes contribute to some issues. So high fructose corn syrup is not the same as table sugar. And then we also have sweeteners like maple syrup and honey, which are going to have the beneficial polyphenols uh, and some nutrients more in maple syrup than honey. But uh, they're, of course, not going to have the fiber and water content. So those will be you know, larger concentrations of glucose and fructose that you'd be taking in when you have those. So you might want to pair it with other foods that would slow down the digestion uh, and fiber and things. So that's kind of what I would say is the overview of just like different fructose sources. Um, of course, you're getting some fructose in like other vegetable type, you know, fruit vegetables like squashes and peppers and things. But the main source is really going to be from from actual fruits in in that context. The small amounts in in those other, you know, from those other carbohydrates is small. Um, and in general, what I would say, and I'll let you uh, go here after Mike, is that if you're healthy metabolically and you're not dealing with insulin resistance, you're not dealing with fatty liver or anything like that, I really wouldn't worry about fructose intake from good sources as long as you aren't dealing with nutrient deficiencies and you're addressing the larger context. I don't think fruit juice is going to be an issue. I don't think dried fruit is going to be an issue. Again, assuming you're digesting everything well, all, all of that, it's ripe. There's not like other toxic components in there. And I think generally those people, you know, are fine with some table sugar as well, maybe even moderate amounts, decent amounts of table sugar. Uh, but I think there's certain contexts where, again, you want to make sure that you're not driving nutrient deficiencies there. I think it's better to be getting more sugar from other sources, whether it's maple syrup or fruit juice or fruit, as opposed to sugar because of the nutrients and polyphenols. But the sugar on its own, like the sugar itself, isn't the problem there. It would be the lack of other things. Um, I would still, you know, even if someone's healthy in general, I would lean away from high fructose corn syrup. But then the other situation is if someone's dealing with glucose metabolism struggles, insulin resistance, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, gout. Uh, anything along those lines, I would be a little bit more careful when it comes to fructose. Uh, I still wouldn't avoid it, but I would titrate up slowly. I would favor slower digesting sources like whole fruits uh, as opposed to juices or honey or something like that. And I would definitely pay attention to how you're tolerating them and how you're responding. Uh, I think that's a huge, huge component. Something we talk about all the time is our response to the foods that we're taking in being a really great indicator for how we're responding, right? And so like how our bodies are doing if it's actually supporting us health-wise. So I would pay attention to those things and how you're responding, but I've seen severe non-alcoholic fatty liver disease improve without any concern of avoiding fruit juice or, you know, I shouldn't even say that, with the inclusion, the intentional inclusion of more fruit juice and more whole fruit uh, and starches as well, and even some sugar sources too. And so, so I don't think that those things have to be avoided especially if there are other issues that are really driving those, driving those processes, which there are. Uh, but especially if those things are being addressed, you might not really have to worry about the fructose at all. But in the interim, I have seen situations where it's helpful to kind of, again, go slower, favor the, the full like whole fruit form that's going to digest slower, has all the components. And the other piece here too is there's a difference between having a fructose source in the context of a meal versus on its own. Again, if you're healthy metabolically and you have some whole fruit as a as, as, as snack on its own, I think that should be fine. Maybe even juice on its own should be fine. Uh, but if not, you might need to worry a little bit more about pairing that with protein and fat to help slow digestion a little bit further. So those are all considerations I would have if, you're, if you have a reason to be concerned about fructose intake, which again is not because of the fructose driving the issue, but rather due to other factors driving the issue. Uh, and again, I would lean toward trying to slow the amount of or in concentration of fructose you're getting in that case. But still getting as much as you can in that context because of how supportive it is uh, in terms of carbohydrates in general, but also some unique factors that have to do with fructose itself. Yeah, I mean, another thing to keep in mind here, a pretty big one is vitamin C, which is also discussed mm -hmm. by, I think, Rick Johnson and uh, Dr. Yep. Rick Johnson and, and Dr. Perlmutter is that um, vitamin C can 
drastically decrease serum uric acid. So I have a quote here. So here we say studies have shown that supplementing vitamin C at 500 milligrams per day for two months can significantly reduce serum uric acid concentrations in patients with hyperuricemia. Moreover, studies have concluded that the incidence rate of gout decreases by 45% with an increasing increase in vitamin C intake. Fruits such as, uh, I don't know how to pronounce, jujubes, uh, guavas, kiwi fruit, strawberries, and oranges are rich in vitamin C. So just getting you having adequate vitamin C in the diet, the best source is obviously going to be fruit, um, is a great way to go. And then other specific fruits that are known to be helpful with gout are actually, uh, I think, black cherries have uh, specific plant compounds that are quite helpful for gout. A lot of the I know tart cherries are. I hadn't heard that about black cherries. Or maybe it was tart, but the cherries overall have a beneficial effect because of some of their plant compounds on um, gout specifically. Um, so incorporating some yeah. of those, if you're dealing with gout or you're dealing with hyperuricemia, having adequate amounts of vitamin C. There's some talk about uh, adequate amounts of magnesium helping to prevent hyperuricemia, having adequate mm-hmm. amounts of zinc. Um, it has been shown to be uh, associated with less get, uh, hyperuricemia. And then adequate amounts of copper um, can have a it can actually inhibit xanthine oxidase as well. So basically having a nutrient-dense diet. And then kind of as you as you mentioned, if you are worried about, you know, fructose and fruits or whatnot whole fruit would be the best way to prioritize first. And then if you were doing fruit juice, something you can do is you combine some fruit juice with some with some of the dried fruits and then you have the fiber with the juice as well. So if it, instead of just having juice by itself, but having the fiber with the juice can help the situation out pretty drastically by altering the rate at which fructose enters hepatic circulation, combining that with protein and fats as well. And like having an actual meal instead of just snacking all day long can also alter the rate at which that fructose is hitting the liver. Because again, it's it's a unit of time where large mm-hmm. doses of fructose at a certain threshold per unit of time becomes a problem. And some of the studies, as we discussed, when they adju- broke up the dosages over periods of time, they saw less issues. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that a lot of these plant compounds, gallic acid, elagic acid, chlorogenic acid, luteolin, cursidin, camphorol, um, catechin, epicatechin, hesperidin, naringenin, naringin, hesperidin, uh, anthocyanins, they all have functions, have functions in inhibiting xanthine oxidase and then increasing the excretion of uric acid at the kidney. So many of these different fruits that includes, there's just a general list, mangoes, guavas. So mangoes also have magnaferin, which has a specific effect, but mangoes, guavas, strawberries, all types of berries, Apples, cherries, um, blueberries, mang- uh, what else do we have here? Bananas, grapes, lemons, oranges, grapefruits, limes. All of these pomegranates have beneficial effects overall through the, some of these specific compounds and through their, their content of vitamin C and through the, some of the vitamins and minerals to help deal with a, with a hyperuricemic situation. So overall, I think that fruits are generally helpful. And I would if you're having any issues with hyperuricemia, focusing on perhaps adding some cherries into the diet and then also um, having whole fruits or, and and if you're going to have juice, combining that with maybe like a dried fruit or a whole fruit, um, maybe having everything all together in a meal. Um, and then we didn't really touch on protein sources, but your the major it, purine protein sources is going to be really organ meats, shellfish, and then like yeast. But um, that wasn't really the main argument in their piece here. And I, I think protein having adequate protein is more important than drastically limiting your protein intake overall because you're worried about purines yeah and the nutrient density there in the organ meats all of that's going to heavily outweigh um any uric acid concerns but yeah i didn't want to you know i wanted to keep it centered on fructose because diving into the other possible you know culprits for increasing uh uric acid would take a lot longer (laughs) yeah Um, so yeah but i i agree with what you're saying for sure uh, yeah. And I would say also if someone's dealing with gout and likely the correlation there with kidney issues, uh, I would also take a look back at our high blood pressure series discussing, you know, the context of high blood pressure, obviously they're having a big relationship with that, having a, a tight relationship with kidney function and also with uric acid. So I'd reference back to those episodes as well, talking about electrolytes and, um, uh, fat soluble, fat soluble vitamins and various other things to help. Uh, improve a hypertensive situation that also don't involve 
reducing fructose. Yeah. And another lasting piece is obviously clearing up the gut. So if you're having a lot of times, a lot of people that I've seen with gout are usually guys. Um, and it's usually guys who have pretty large bellies. <laughs> um, and the, the large belly comment is not like to make fun of anybody, but to point out usually a, a dysbiosis or an endotoxemia situation. So usually that large belly is a sign of inflammation, increased visceral fat, and then usually an endotoxemia that goes with the obesity and metabolic syndrome and impairment of liver function. So usually I see the, the combination of those, or I see it in patients who have kidney issues. And you, the kidney issues, again, is pro feature or product of metabolic syndrome. So a lot of these processes are driven by same, the, like similar etiologies. It's just how the individuals, what the individual's predisposition is. And so fixing, and a lot of times, gut is central in this. So fixing the gut in these situations, which can be accomplished by moving towards uh, having adequate fruits and certain specific vegetables in your diet, getting adequate of your vitamins and minerals, having adequate amounts of protein, et cetera, and then maybe doing, have, putting in some interventions to try and alter the microbiome could be helpful in clearing up some of those issues overall. Yeah, I'll, I'll link back to our episodes discussing, discussing gut health, digestion, uh, ways to improve microbial balance. Because uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to go into there, uh, and as you're saying overall, of course, these in general being metabolic issues, endotoxin being a huge driver there. We saw that with the fecal the fecal microbial uh, microbiota transplantation study very clearly as far as how much of an effect that's having. Uh, we see in fatty liver, so yeah, uh, and then of course, I mean, PUFA intake being another major one. But there's a whole there's a ton of things that are involved in improving uh, metabolic health and and supporting energy production, and that's why we talk about. That's why we have a podcast to talk through all those. So um, I'll, I'll reference back to all the relevant episodes. But of course, if somebody is new here and they're dealing with gout and they're not sure where to start, I would head back to you know episode one and, and you know learn about the basics, foundations, things like how to support and optimize gut and digestion, blood sugar regulation, all that. Yep. Awesome. All right. That's going to do it for this series discussing fructose and uric acid. If you did like it, please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere, please leave a review or five-star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. If you do have any questions that you'd like us to answer on a future episode, feel free to send those in to j at jfeldmanwellness.com. That's j-a-y at jayfeldmanwellness.com. Or feel free to leave those in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. To check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. You can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode. And if you're dealing with any symptoms or conditions related to fructose and uric acid, maybe these are conditions that we've described throughout this series related to insulin resistance or diabetes, or maybe it's gout, heart disease, or other metabolic issues, or maybe you're dealing with various symptoms that are less tightly related to fructose and uric acid. Maybe it's chronic cravings and hunger, low energy or fatigue, chronic pain, weight gain, uh, gut issues or digestive symptoms, brain fog, poor sleep, hormonal imbalances, or various other low energy symptoms. Then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course. Where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.